first for me. This is the first time since I've been saved that I've ever had one of my elders move on to another congregation. I've done that twice myself, but I never knew how it felt from the other side, so it's interesting. And uh, certainly believe and know John 15 says that God always visits the vineyard. And uh, when the vineyard's doing well, he still prunes because it can do better. And so I hope you'll take encouragement and know that God is at work doing great things here. He has done great things here. He is at work doing something maybe we don't understand, but great things are coming down the road too. For his kingdom, for his glory. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 4 of Genesis, if you want to turn there. Chapter 4 of Genesis. And you know, my problem is i got way too much to say. I mean, I've got a thousand sermons going on. <laughs> uh, there's a whole book here full of sermons, right? And I pray, Lord, help me just to, 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 to speak what I know you want me to say. And uh, So I don't make any apologize for it. I don't apologize for anything I'm going to say because I'm going to try to keep it biblical. But I know that it's hard for me to get up here. And I, I, let me turn this around here. I want to be sensitive to people's seats. And, uh, you know, I was told you can't handle it, this, the head, the can't handle any more than the head that the seat can handle. So we got nice comfortable seats here, though. I do like that. <laughs> Amen. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to start reading verse 1. It says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve. The King James says he knew her. And in the Bible, when he says he knew her, that means that that, that relationship produced offspring. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flock, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. They were probably pretty close in age. I don't know if they were twins, but they were pretty close in age. And uh, Cain, he decided to take his father's profession, right? Uh, Adam was a gardener. That's what God gave him as a job to do. And so Cain, like a lot of children, a lot of sons, they'll take their dad's profession. That's what he did. But, but Abel, he wanted, to, uh, he wanted to hang out with the sheep and the goats. <laughs> he loved the animals, right? Uh, he became a farmer of sorts and with cattle, a, a herder. So it came about, verse 3, in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Well, Cain told Abel his brother this. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, You have done, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your blood, brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Father, we, we ask that in some new way, God, that you would show us who you are and what you require of us. And I know there are people here this morning who are sold out, committed to your word. It's inerrant, infallible. It means what it says, says what it means. And, and, and it's what we're all going to have to give an account to, what you've given us, Father. And maybe there's some here this morning who are full of doubt, skepticism, maybe not sure whether, what they believe. And uh, surely we've had a lot of hardships this week. Some are coming and their life is good and easy, and we just praise you for that. But a lot of us come with a lot of tension in us, God, a lot of struggle, a lot of... A lot of things that, you know, uh, because of the world we're living in, uh, we've got to deal with. And it's not very heavenly. So whatever it is, Father, we right now just humbly ask that you would give each one of us a portion of our daily bread. And that everyone here would be edified. And if anyone here this morning has never come to you right, who's never made it right with you, that this morning they would understand how to do that, that your spirit would draw them to Jesus Christ, and that they would make the decision to trust in you as their Savior and Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So you got some things going on. This, most of us who know the Word of God or the Bible, uh, this is a familiar story. 
right? You've got Cain and you've got Abel. What you got is a tragedy. But, but we should all know that God will save anyone because he saved Adam, right? If he'd save Adam, he'd save anybody. Because no one has done as worse as Adam. When you think of it, Adam, man, he really screwed it up, didn't he? I mean, I've screwed a lot of things up in my life, but I've never done as bad as Adam. See, because I started out wrong. <laughs> I didn't come into this world perfect and pure. I came in a little sinner whining and crying. <laughs> right? But Adam was made... He was, he was imputed to righteousness, gifted it right from the get-go. He didn't have an internal sin nature and an internal struggle and things. And uh, you know, Adam, Adam was treacherous. Adam was rebellious. Adam did what none of us have done to the same degree. And so when God came into the garden and provided a redemption, provided an atonement, a covering, and a cleansing for Adam and Eve to be made clean and given, and so they could still have access to him in some way, even though they lost that little garden, that little temple. Uh, you've got to know this, that you've never done nothing yet, that, that bad, okay? And then I figure that Adam and Eve, sometime after that, had these two children, and maybe a whole lot more, but with these two, they must have taught them, they must have told them the stories, right? Of how they just woke up one day, and God was there. And they walked with God, and they talked with God, and they had everything was good. Everything was good. And how that they rebelled, and how that they broke the heart of God, how they transgressed, and how that sin separated them from God, and how God provided an atonement for them. How that he shed the blood of an innocent animal, and made a covering for their sins and for their bodies. Because now they knew they were naked, and they were ashamed. Before, they didn't even know they were naked, I don't believe. They were covered with the light that we're going to be covered with, the Bible says, in heaven. Robes of righteousness. I don't know what that's going to look like. It's going to look a lot better than these guys. Amen? Amen. I'm looking for those ones. Righteous robes. Righteous rags is what I got now. <coughs> Righteous robes. And anyway, so they must have knew. And it says the time came for them. They were grown up enough that they had to stop living on mom and daddy's dirt, shirt tail. There are no grandchildren in heaven. Don't get me wrong. But the kingdom of heaven is full of children. Jesus sat them on his leg and said, don't hinder them because my kingdom is full of them. Amen? Every child that's ever died before the age of accountability is in heaven. There is no guilt of Adam for them. Jesus Christ took care of Adam's guilt for humanity. And uh, we're not going to get into Romans 5, but if you want to read that, you'll find out that. Anyway, so they, they, they're, you know, I think every child, every kid needs to realize this. There just comes a point where you've got to make your own mind up. And you've got to make your own decision and your own commitment about your relationship to God. And that's what's happening for, for Cain and Abel. And of course, they knew how to come to God. You know, one of the problems that, that uh, I've, I've noticed with people is not that they don't know how to come to God. They won't come to God. You know, Jesus never blamed anyone for not understanding. You don't come to me because you don't understand. He never said that. He said, you will not come to me. You see, there's uh, something we inherited from our father Adam that is treacherous, that is rebellious, that is arrogant, that is proudful, is self-willed, self-empowered, self-directed. And it is in opposition to God. And Abel had. But Abel, he come the way God required. Turn to Micah chapter 6 if you would. See, in Micah we have uh, Israel's mess at this point. They've been a mess for a long time. So it's basically a Let's see, Micah, you just got to go back a few books from uh, Malachi. And here it says, it asks the question, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearly calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And verse 8 says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? You see, men aren't ignorant. Romans 1 puts it very clearly that everyone is guilty for what they know. And you know, I've got a belief that if every man who gets that revelation when it comes will respond the way God requires, he'll give them more light. I'm talking about that African person over there that I've heard used as an excuse for not doing home missions. <laughs> in the jungle somewhere who's never heard of God, do you know that the nature, that the design, the blueprint of all creation 
declares and testifies God's existence, his perfections, his powers, his presence. No man doesn't know that God is there. We may educate people to believe he doesn't get there, but we're born with that. And you know, here, uh, also in Romans 2 it goes on and it says that there's something in us. It's not just out of us, out here in the world we're living in. I mean, nothing comes from nothing, right? And we've got to have something adequate to the cause, and that's God. You got nothing, you get nothing. That's the way that works when we're talking about creation. Uh, you've got to have God. You have to have some supremely uh, perfect, all-powerful, all-knowing, wise, intelligent, benevolent God. And you can pick whoever you want, but there's just one, right? And here he says... He has told you. He's told you by the world you're living in. That's the world book. He has told you because he has written his moral law in your heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 that you're without excuse because it's in you. And now we live in an existential world where everybody wants to think personal relative morals and everything's relative and it's up to the subject and the situation and all that. You know, I've even had people tell me that there is right and wrong. You should make it up. Everybody knows there's something right and wrong. Everybody knows, right? I mean, if you ever find someone who says there ain't, I heard that, uh, and I'm getting some of this from, I, I listen to sermons all the time, started the Bible all the time, just love this book. But I mean, I've met a few people who wanted to push this on me. Let me punch them in the nose. Or you take a baseball bat and go break the windshield out of their car. You'll find out whether they believe it's right or wrong. They'll tell you you did something wrong. And I just want to laugh and say, no, we didn't. <laughs> you would tell me what's right and wrong, great one, right? No, we all have it built into us. And it may depend somewhat on the culture we've been born into and the family that raised us and the education we've had. But beyond all of that, men are without excuse, the Bible says, because that which may be known of God is clearly evident to them. And if someone who's never heard of Jesus Christ lives in a place where there is no church to give a witness and they will respond to general, general revelation the right way. We're gonna, that's what I want to look at. How does a man come to God? Then I believe God will give them more light. I believe Jesus Christ can appear to them just like he did to the Apostle Paul. Nothing's impossible with God. The problem's not God. And you know that's another problem, isn't it? People want to blame God in our culture today for everything. Hey, what's wrong? God didn't do it. I have no problem with that we got to quit blaming God for the things we do, right? You know what kept me from coming to God right was that I was molested as a child, and I blamed God for it. <laughs> and I could not come to God, and I would not come to God, and even the very act of me coming to God was my last ditch of self salvation. And I'm glad that he'll take when you come to him finally broken. Look, what does he require? Verse 8, he has told you, O oh man, what is good, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Humility, mercy, and justice. How can someone come to God? I do not believe that the offering was the problem. I think if Cain would have offered a thousand goats, God still would have rejected his offering. You see, because his heart was wrong. Right? First of all, he didn't come with God's provision, did he? He did know what God required, and God required the life of an innocent animal so that his sins could be somehow covered temporarily. And in that act of obedience, he was expressing faith in the word of God, the revelation of God. And when we do that, God says, I declare you righteous because you have heard me and obeyed. That's what faith is. And what maturity is, when your heart finally really falls in love with him and everything you do is an act of obedience. Out of love. That's what we call honor. Not just obedience. Man, I was obedient for several years to God after he saved me. Struggling with my inside. Go, I gotta do that. That's a law, right? <laughs> I gotta do that. That's a rule. And then don't worry where you're at. You started this journey right. Because you'll get to a place where it naturally flows out of a heart filled with the Holy Spirit in control. A heart of love. And there are no more burdens and there are no more commands. It's just love. And what a wonderful thing it is. God help me, because my own love was very rock, <laughs> very small. It really is. But we know what Cain knew. And you know, Cain come with the work of his own hands, right? And Cain is a religious man. He is just like his father Adam. What did Adam do? Well, he went and got a fig leaf. He had the first pair of Levi's. I heard one guy say. <laughs> but he, he, he came to approach God covered in his own work. And it wouldn't work. 
And God gave him a remedy. God gave him an instruction. God gave him a righteousness. God forgave him and covered him. Amen? And God, I'm convinced that God would have accepted Cain, too, if he had come with the right offering and the right heart. You see, we're in a battle between good and evil. And if there was a good world you were living in, then the shape you're in, you'd still have a battle right in here with it. If you were in the perfect environment, you'd still find there's a battle going on between the fallen man, Adam, and there's some other thing in us called the image and likeness of God that produces an inner conflict. You may not know God, but you're still going to have this conflict. It's there. There's something wrong. I know that I do what's wrong when I want to do what's right. And when I want to do what's right, I know I do what's wrong. It don't matter if you're Christian or lost. That conflict exists within you. You say to yourself, that's your own conscience, bear witness to the law of God within your heart. The Bible says, there's something wrong, and how can I be made right? How can a man be made right with God? It's a good question, isn't it? First of all, it's in the offering. See, the Bible says that Jesus is the door, right? You want to get into heaven? You've got to knock on the right door. You've got to go through the right door. He didn't say he's a door, the tallest door, the biggest door, the best door. He said, I am the door, right? He said, I'm the way, not the best way, not the narrowest way, not the straightest way. He says, I'm the only way. And no man's going to come to the Father but by me. I like what John, it's not, I like what John, uh, what the John the Baptist said. When he said, hey, stop doing what you're doing. Pay attention. Look, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Right? And I mean, there's literally nothing you could have done or ever will do that is greater than that sacrifice. You see, that sacrifice is greater than all the sin of man. It really is. And the, the apostle John later, 1 John, he says, he's not only the propitiation of covering for the sins of those who trusted in him, but for the sins of the whole world. Somehow in that first lamb that was sacrificed, there was Christ covering in that. And when he died on the cross... Oh, this wonderful solution became very clear for mankind. The wrath of God that is reserved against all those who continue to do unrighteousness was paid in full. <laughs> that is the wonderful news of the cross. The bad news of the Bible is, is that we're all as bad as God says we are. Now, don't hear me wrong. I'm a Christian humanist. I believe in the potential of humankind because I believe in the power and perfections and presence and wisdom of God. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, but we got problems with ourselves. We're destroying things because we're fallen and we're sinful and we are as bad as God says we are. And God won't receive us but one way. And Cain, he didn't want to, he's got problems in here. You see, Abel could have been rejected killing a lamb. You see, God did not receive Abel's offering merely because it was the right way. The right, the right offering. You see, in Isaiah chapter 1, you read that, Isaiah chapter 1. God said, please, I'm about ready to throw up. That's what he said. I cannot handle all of your sacrifices and the blood you're shedding of goats and rams. I'm tired of your church services. I'm tired of everything about you. Why? Because even though they had the right offering, they had the wrong heart. And I would suggest this. Think of these three H's. Head, hands, heart. Or head, heart, hands. That way. It is required of a man that he does what's right. To act justly. Right? That's, that's how a man can come. To do what is right. Well, if you can't determine what's right because yours is different than me, God is righteous. Why we don't understand this? God says he alone is good. And that offended Cain. See, Cain went and talked to Abel about this. When his offering wasn't received, he went and talked to his brother. And my guess is his brother said, hey, Cain, why are you upset? He said the same thing God said. You know how God wants us to come to him. Humble yourself, brother. You know, and in, the, in, you know, in the, him talking to Cain and this Cain's pride and arrogance and resistance and rebellion, it was building and building, and he just thought, you think you're better than I am because God accepted you. Anyway, I don't know how it went, but he grabbed something and bashed it. <laughs> and we had the first murder. Whoa. Wow. I mean, things had already been dying, but we hadn't had any murder at this point. It didn't take long, did it? There's something wrong with us. Something wrong with all of us. And God has a solution. God has a solution, but how did we receive Jesus is that solution. 
It was Peter who said on the day of Pentecost, he says, there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but that man, Jesus Christ. Right? And of course, you know, some people want to say, well, that's awful narrow-minded. Well, who are we to tell God what's right and what's wrong? When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, think of this. He said, Father, if there is any other way. Didn't he say that? Didn't Jesus say, if there's one other way, except this one, please let's do that. And it wasn't just because he was going to suffer. He was in his flesh. He, that apparently God doesn't know another way. Because Jesus was crucified, and for our iniquities and our transgressions, he was crushed. God caused the sun to be blotted out, and he took it out on his son. What you and I have to pay. Yeah. And apparently God don't know another way to justify a man. Because Jesus himself said, if there's some other way, please. Nevertheless, you're right. And I'm going that way. And you know one of the hardest things it is for anybody? I remember sitting at a, at a table in Bristol. I saw the Spirit of God convicting a man, and he was ripping the pew at that service, and he just would not come to Jesus. And Jesus was calling him, and the Spirit was at work in him, and I invited him up to the restaurant after. I mean, God was telling me, I'm working on this guy, you get him, right? And, and we get up to the restaurant, <laughs> and amidst a few other things like that, his brother was uh, his brother was saying, how come you don't get saved? He was getting a little overboard on it, you know, driving the thing there. And I said, look, I said, I know why you didn't get saved. And he looked at me and laughed, and he said, oh, you do, do you? Pride. That's all I said. One word. Hallelujah. <laughs> His pride got broke. Just one word. Pride. Do you know, Cain was filled with it. He came with the best of his offering. He didn't come with God's offering. And you see, God's ways look foolish to us, don't they? All right, come on, let's admit it. Lots of times I can scratch my head and go, okay. <laughs> you know, okay, Lord. <laughs> That's your way. I'll, I'll go. I can't see how it's going to work out, but I'll trust you. So the offer, Cain's heart was like all of our hearts at some time. He had dug his heels in. He said, God, I love you. I know who you are, and I'm going to come give you the best I got. But I'm going to tell you something. God don't want your best. He wants your best. Yeah. God wants you to come humbly to say, God, I need mercy. I love mercy. I could not be standing here right now without the mercy of God. I was split hell wide open a long time ago, and that's not a funny thing. <laughs> that's not a funny thing. I used to reject mercy and despise mercy and hate mercy and curse God. And God had mercy on me and mercy on me. I love mercy. And he was merciful to me that in my pride and in my rejection of him, he continuously, I mean continuously, I praise the Lord for Christian parents who sold the word of God to me because I couldn't get away from it. I could get high, but not high enough to get out, outrun the most high. I could get drunk, but I couldn't get drunk enough to outrun the Word of God. I could do anything, but the Word of God was sown in me. And I praise God for that. It was a mercy of God to be born into a Christian family, or I'd have been dead from suicide. I wouldn't have had people praying for me and doing the work of God, the Lord of God. Mercy rejoices over judgment. God was being merciful to Cain. Look at what he says. He says, Cain, if you'd have done it, what I asked, you'd be happy right now. But I can't receive what's not the best, what I require. I can't receive it. God will not receive it. I think it's a foolish thing that men do to themselves to change anything God says and think he'll offer it. He will not. There are some scary passages in Scripture, and I'm not into making no one afraid, but when I read them, they put a little fear into me. Like many will say to me, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, 21. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? I can stop right there because that's what I do every day. I preach from this book to a crowd of people. Some days I do it three times. I mean, I, the world of my pulpit, I'm a preacher. That's what I do. And I don't need any place to do it. I'll preach when I'm on the log prayer lap. I'm always preaching. And you know why I'm long with it because to me it's short. <laughs> But, but you know, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter when, when, when we come to God and we're not humbling ourselves. You want to know, as a Christian, sometimes the reasons we carry our burdens and they stress us the most, 
Jesus said, I want you to learn from me because I am meek and I am lowly or I'm humble. He says, sit down here at my feet. Well, that comes after him saying, hey, if you're heavy hearted, if your load's heavy and your burdens get you stressed, he says, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and the burden's light. But that doesn't happen if you don't humble yourself and sit down at his feet. That's the premise to that promise. You humble you and God will lift you up. Oh, you know the most calm, you know the most quoted Old Testament uh, 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 phrase? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What does God require of any of us anytime, all the time? The only thing I've ever read about the Bible God had was faith. And that's simply when I say, yes, God. No Aaron. Yes, God. No world. Yes, God. No devil. Yes, God. Don't matter. Because God is righteous. He never has done anything wrong. He never could do anything wrong. He never will do anything wrong. And Cain came to him as if he was his own little God. And God said, hey, look at this phrase he says, sin is crouching at the door. Well, the same word in the Hebrew, and I did look this up, I heard another, I, I love Bobby Jackson, and some of this I'm stealing from him, and some of it I was thinking about for a long time. But I looked it up, the Hebrew word for sin also means sin offering. And it's just like God was saying to Cain, Cain, there's a sin offering at the door. Take it. Take it. I haven't treated you differently than I've treated Abel. I'm certain, excuse me, that no, God never arbitrarily sent anyone to hell. Okay? God never arbitrarily put anyone in heaven. There's something he says here. You do what is right. <laughs> That's what God requires. That we humble. What's right? We humble ourselves. And we take the position of a creature to the Creator. Do you know the word worship in Hebrew means nothing more than bow down? That's all it means is bow down. First time it's used in the Bible is for Abraham. He said, Me and my ladder going up the hill to worship. Can you imagine the load that Abraham felt he was bowed down under? I'm going to go murder my son. They're going to put me in a straitjacket and throw away the key in the same time, right? But he heard God and he believed. And he said, I know God is great. If I burn him to ashes, God can bring him back. Because he said, through him. He's going to give me a, a multitude of people, right? That's faith. I'm telling you, that's what it is. And you know, there's a sin offering for everyone. I like evangelism explosion. Anyone ever heard of that? I, I've read and studied more evangelism courses than you can shake a stick at. Well, I like everyone evangelizing everyone everywhere. <laughs> that's one more even they got. <laughs> but everyone evangelizing everyone everywhere because there is a way you can come to God. Amen? There is a sacrifice at the door. There is a provision for everyone. God's no respecter of persons. I have no right to come to him because I didn't look at pornography this week or because I didn't cuss a swear streak or because I didn't shoot Neil Meyer or come at your stuff. I got no right to come to God thinking I've earned anything with him. And sometimes I think that we feel like God owes us something. And we've got him on the hook now. God, I've been good. And I said no to that. Now you owe me some paper. That ain't the way it works. God owes no one nothing. Thank God. I hope you'll learn to love mercy. Because the definition I've heard of that is stuff that's pretty well accepted and known is when you don't get what you deserve. I don't want what I deserve. The best things in life I've learned are free because they're gifts from God. They're not easy. Don't get me wrong. It ain't easy following Jesus Christ in a world as wicked as this one. And it don't like to hear this message. I take an order. I got called by Bible, Bible, Bible Thumper this week. And I was like, hallelujah. I didn't even reach to this person. I wonder what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's the mercy of God. It's the mercy of God when we understand that God's desire is for our countenance and for our good and for his glory. You know, we, humankind's in predicament, aren't they? How can we come? We can realize there is a way that God will accept, an offering that he will accept. And we must humble ourselves. We've got to humble ourselves. The only thing that will keep you from entering into, the, into heaven is if you reject his offering because you're too proud to receive it. That's the only thing. And you know what? You can tell God, leave me alone all you want. 
Because he loves you and he's better than your bad, he'll keep on knocking on that door of your heart. He'll keep on sending some foolish preacher to your way. He'll keep on witnessing to you through what he's made. He'll keep on testifying from your conscience. Because he is a God of mercy. Amen? I'm telling you, you're in a situation that if there was no God of mercy, you'd be in real trouble. So would I. But God is merciful. The Bible says his mercies are new every day. I wake up rejoicing. I don't care how I feel because I'm, I'm covered in the mercy of God. Amen? Amen? And the grace of God provided what I don't deserve. I don't deserve the wonderful, wow, the, the love that God poured out in my heart. I was a merciful, hateful individual. Yeah, I even tried to take my own life. Thank God for mercy, amen? And God graciously said, Aaron, finally, you hit rock bottom. Finally, you know that there's no answer in this world from humankind whatsoever. It ain't in medicine, it ain't in education, it isn't in industry, it isn't in your country or in your genetics. It's in Jesus Christ. And I had no one else to turn to. And I said, God, if you can save me, would you please save me? I'm a wicked sinner. Help me. If you take me, I'm yours. That's humility. That's where you realize I am hopeless without Christ. There are no other answers. And we're always trying to give answers for a spiritual problem with a lot of other methods. And I mean, there, it's, it's there. Things not spiritual either, folks. I'm telling you what, when my head's aching, I, I, I may pray, Lord, help my head to go away, but I usually take that. If it persists, I'll go see a doctor. Because that's my head. That's my body. I take care of it. But the soul of man, that's going to go on. The body's going to lay down. Get a new one someday, hallelujah. Because of the mercy and grace of God. And humbly, humbly. Do you know one of the greatest problems that I have struggled with since I've been saved? I heard Pastor Mike proclaim this a week ago or two weeks ago. I don't know is pride. And I think if we're all honest in our heart, we would have to say pride is what keeps us from obeying God even though we love Him. Pride is what robs us of the blessings of heaven. When I received Christ, He shed the Holy Spirit in my heart and I experienced love. That was just amazing. I'm still swimming around in that pool, by the way. Love. Heard someone say, Lord, help us to love more. Well, be careful what you pray because grace is not grace if you feel like doing it because they may have Evokes some compassion in your heart or something. No, grace is totally undeserved, totally unearned. It's, I've had to be gracious a lot, the Bible says. I didn't need to be gracious as a pastor very often because people in the church are health, healthy and whole pretty much. We struggle with doing problems in life, but people in the are broken. I'm not saying you might not be here this morning and broken, and I'm not trying to make them look bad, but broken people. Man, if you can't be gracious, good luck, you won't make it because they don't deserve it and they can't earn it. They need mercy. Don't they? they need grace. God has given grace. Grace upon grace. Peace. Wow. Peace. I mean, I mean, this thought that yes, it's conflict. You can be in a war with everything in the whole world. I'm like Antipas. You ever heard of Antipas? Well, they killed him for Jesus' name, and he stood in front of a Roman Colosseum, and he said, If the world is against me, then I'm against the world. Antipas. There's a war going on, if you didn't know it, and he's in the thick of it right here, isn't he? Well, he says, look down there, he says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. You know why I don't believe Cain ever repented? Because he's still making excuses to try to justify himself. God, you're being unfair. I give you my best. You're being unfair. Well, I'm going to surprise you with something. There are murderers in heaven. Yes, there are. There are adulterers in heaven. There are liars in heaven. There are thieves in heaven. It's an amazing thing that the people we don't see fit to live around with, and we lock them up and execute them sometimes, that God, when they will humble themselves, and they will cry out for the mercy of God, that's where you fall on the mercy of God. That's where you know you don't deserve what you're asking for. God will make you fit for the streets of gold. Amen. Oh, I'm so glad God's not like me. I'm so glad he's not like you too. God's not a man, right? No, Jesus was a man, but he wasn't just a man. You see, and in Christ, everything that Adam lost for you, Christ has given much more. That's the wonderful news of this. And you can persist in your pride. You may not even like to say it over and over again, but you can persist in your pride. And at one point, God's just going to say, okay, have it your way. 
what he said to Cain. There's mercy and grace here. God's, God shows his mercy and saying, okay, Cain, I'm going to make sure no one attacks you. I'm going to make sure that you're protected. Because Cain's whining here, right? And God's still being merciful to him. But he can't be gracious to him. You see, because grace only comes when we do the right thing. We fall on the mercy of God and humble ourselves. And when we humble ourselves, the most wonderful, amazing thing happens. It's called new birth. It's where the Holy Spirit takes that sacrifice for my sins and he covers me with it. And I no longer stand before God as separated, sinful, treacherous, doomed for eternity without him. I no longer stand in that position today because of God's goodness. Amen. And the gospel is my favorite message. I will preach it as long as I live. I don't know. I hope I never have to suffer for it. But if I do, I don't care because you know what? i got eternal life. I got the very thing I don't deserve because of the goodness of God. Amen? Amen? And you can share this with anybody, but I'll tell you what the habit I had for a while <coughs> was I left out the bad news. And I'll tell you what, the good news don't make much sense when you don't understand the bad news. And I would encourage you, this ain't about trying to play guilt trips on nobody. It ain't about trying to scare the hell out of people or scare heaven into them. It ain't about a lot of the things that you might not want to do anyway. What it is about is just simply being faithful to the full word of God and saying, look, we are sinful. We are separated from God and we cannot offer God anything to remedy this. He will not accept anything. Jesus said, you know, anybody who comes in any other way than by the door, they're liars. They're thieves. And they're going to get to the door, and it ain't going to open. I'll close with this. Pilgrim's Progress, one of my favorite little storybooks. I would encourage everyone to read it a few times. Uh, but there was this guy named Fain Hope, and he got across the, the, the valley of the shadow of death. He got right to the celestial city itself, and he got up to the door, and they asked him, Do you have your document? <laughs> it's a birth certificate. It's what it is. It says, Born again. Child of God, join heir with Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what it says. <laughs> and he fumbled around. He said, well, he said, no, but I got here. And, they, and, and the angels were commanded to bind him and to take him. And Christian said, and I learned that even from the gates of heaven, there is a way to hell. You see, because you can't get there any other way. If you try to get there any other way, it's going to end up not good. So my, my, I don't know, maybe everybody in here, God only knows your heart. Maybe you've got a good dose of religion and you need to get saved because God won't accept your fig leaves. He won't accept your fruit. He won't accept the work of your hands. It's already tainted. We're all fallen. We're all in the same boat. No point in judging any one of us amongst one of ourselves, but we're all there, right? This is the good news of the gospel. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord, and I'll tell you, if you'll come and say, God, I'm a sinner, please, I know I don't deserve it. I love you. I need your mercy. Be merciful to me. We know that the guy went, the religious guy went up to the temple and he prayed. He liked me. He put his hands in the air and, oh God, I want to thank you that I'm not like the rest of the people. <laughs> right? I mean, I got it together and I'm giving a lot and I'm doing all these things right, like that. And then that other guy came up that everybody didn't like. And he, he, he tore the buttons on his shirt there and then he said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Jesus asked that simple question. He said, who went away justified? We know the answer, don't we? The one who went away justified was the one who did what was right. And he humbled himself and called on God to be merciful to him. And when we will do that, and that is the only way you can be saved, is to have the right offering, and that's Jesus Christ. It is to humble yourself, to do what is right, and call on the name of Jesus. When you do that, you say, I got no strings attached. I got nothing to boast in. I got no future without you. I'm not coming to you and saying, if anything or why anything, I'm coming, God, and if you'll take me, I'll be yours. I'm coming, God, as a sinner, and if you'll save me, I'll be saved. And if you'll do that, you'll find the most amazing, wonderful thing happen. You will regret that you never did it when you were a little child. I do. Is that God, who is real and living and maybe speaking to your heart, will come in by the presence and power of His Holy Spirit and will verify to you that you are His daughter, that you are His son, 
that you are his child. You'll no longer need the preacher to say, uh, oh, you're saved. Or you'll no, you won't have to ask anybody. Do you think I'm saved? When I hear someone say that, I say, no. <laughs> I don't think you're saved. I think if you were saved, you'd know. <laughs> I really do believe that. Because, man, when he comes in, can I get a witness? When the Holy Spirit comes in, and that, I believe that happens when we call on the name of Jesus, God saves us. And when he comes in, you know that you know because it ain't just about a belief anymore, it's an experience. And it comes from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, and it changes you from the inside out. It turns your world upside down, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Our Father, we know that the Bible's a big book. And there's a lot of, it's just, there's a lot of, it's human history, and there's a lot of problems in that. There's a lot of trouble there. And we just look around us, nothing's changed, God. We're still in the dark. We're still lost looking for answers. And I pray that anyone in here this morning who, who's still looking for answers, that they would understand that you are the answer. And that they would humble themselves and do what is right. And call on your name, Jesus. You would verify that. You said this is the work that a man can do, that God requires of a man, that they believe on the one he has sent. That's the only work you're going to require from us, Lord. It's the only one you're going to accept. So I do pray that if anyone in here this morning has never done that, that they would do that. And Father, for those of us who've done that, we thank you. Oh, we do love your mercy. We sing about it. We dance about it. We do all kinds of things. We're all different. We express that in different ways. But we rejoice in you, God, and your goodness to us. And Lord, help us to be motivated by the fact there is an eternity coming. And the people we love people we don't love, our brothers and sisters in Christ whom we love, and then there's enemies to you in the world who are enemies to us, Father, that we would overcome evil with good, and that's the power of the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, that in the troubles around us, we would be bastions of peace and hope and your glory. Father, for those who hate, that we would overcome it with your love. Father, there is no way in this world, but heaven is open, and that's how your word closes. Come, if you're thirsty. If you're looking for the solution, come. Father, we come. Thank you for the opportunity to share with this wonderful group this morning. Thank you, Lord. We trust this fellowship to your care. And you're going to do great things here. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, Lord.